Sin Osme. That song that we sang, Shout to the Lord, all the earth. What does it what does it sound like if we shout together? My question is why would we shout together? Why? What is shout in Hebrew? What is it in Hebrew? Do you know? Teruwa. When do we teruwa? Why do we teruwa? What is the purpose of? Let's just think about that. We'll think about that. Hold that thought until we get to the end. Today we're looking at uh, Leviticus 12 to 15. Meto- Tazria and Metzora, two portions. And I'm thinking of how far Israel has come since last year this time. Remember when they came out of wilderness, out of Egypt? Not out of the wilderness, out of Egypt. And uh, a year before this, they came through the Red Sea. They were delivered from, his, from Egypt. Came through the Red Sea. They encountered the enemy. They came to Mara. It didn't have water. They gave, they, the Father gave them the manna to eat came to the mountain of Sinai, ready to receive the word of our Father. That was a year ago. Now, what happened? Now the tabernacle is standing. When is the consecration happening of the tabernacle? Which month? What month is the tabernacle consecrated? Well, what month is the tabernacle finally erected and the priesthood is consecrated? This month. Nisan. Aviv. It says on the first of the month, the first of the month, the priests were set apart, or set aside for seven days and to, to wash themselves, to clean themselves, to prepare themselves to be set apart so that on the eighth day, the tabernacle can be, the, can be entered with offerings, with sacrifices so that the priesthood can be consecrated. What date was that? The eighth of Aviv. Just four, five days, five days, what's it? My maths never worked. A couple of days before Pesach. So, six days. Thank you. There we are. Six days before the eighth, fourteen. Fourteen, yes, six days. Thank you. So, so when, before, the, before this happens, before, remember we have read Leviticus Vaikra 10 two weeks ago. And this is when, um, the priesthood was ready to enter the, where they entered the tabernacle. The glory of the Father was already in the, residing in the tabernacle. And we, are need, we need to find a way in. And it comes through consecration. It comes to a priesthood that is being set apart to go into the tabernacle and to perform the priestly duties as the Father has set aside. So, the glory of the Father dwells in our midst. That's an int- how does this work? Oh, that one. So, so how does it apply in our lives? Does it have any application in our lives? Does the glory of the Father dwell in our midst? To what extent does the glory of the Father dwell in our midst? And are we set apart as priests for the kingdom at the moment? Just ideas. But know this. We need some help. In this process, we need some... I'm always confronted with the idea. When I'm thinking about the priesthood and our responsibility before the Father and our walking among broken people and... You know, when, when, when Peter and his friends walked the roads, you know what they did? They lined the sick up next to the road. And as they walked past... The glory of the Father dwelt with them to such an extent that they were healed. So why, why, where are we? Wonder. I know we need help. That's what I need. That's what I know and need. So, what we have learned in Vaikra, the the book of being, proclaiming the, the, the ways that our Father wants our lives to be set apart, we know that to listen to our Father's voice is our life. That is proclaimed all, over, all the way through. He says in Exodus 19, he says, If you will hear my voice and listen to my commandments, you will be my amsigula, my set-apart people. Okay, so that's it. So we need 
to know that to listen to his voice is our life. And this is, this maintains, that is the way that we go. And in this portion, this time that the priesthood are consecrated, remember this is now weeks ago, is in this, in this time that we are set apart, taken out of uh, when our lives are being prepared and placed on, a, on, a, on an area where we are set apart, holy before the Father. It is an interesting thing because the Father invites us. You know, initially when, when, um, when they came to the mountain, the Father said to Moses, put a hedge around the mountain so that the people can't draw near. If any one of them comes near to the mountain, if they come through that hedge, what will happen to them? They will die. You and, your, and Joshua, come up. And some of the elders. Now we are invited to enter into the tabernacle because now we can bring our, our korbanot, we can bring our sacrifices into the tabernacle. So the, the relationship is deepening. We are invited to come and to worship in the tabernacle. And where we are, we, we came through different phases of understanding. First in Exodus 19.5, it says that if you will hear my voice and obey my commandments, then you will be my set-apart people. That's the beginning of the whole betrothal story between Israel and our Father. Remember they received the living words in Exodus 20, but this was the beginning of it. And then uh, Exodus 22 to 24, actually, I don't know why there's 23, I think it's the 24. It is the ways that we as a congregation, or we as a nation, could function together in peace. And as we function together in peace and wholeness and, set up, and, and living a life before our Father of cleanness, then we will be happy and united and the glory of the Father will be with us. And then in uh, Exodus 25 to 31, we receive the instructions, or Moses received the instructions to build the, the tabernacle, the Mishkan. He's up on the mountain, the Father gives him the blueprints, everything is great. The nation sits at the bottom waiting for the return, but they get frustrated. And that's where the 13 attributes of our Father's mercy is shown. And um, the 13 attributes of mercy is in Exodus 34, verse 6, where our Father says, Yahweh, Yahweh, al rachum Vechanun, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love and in truth, forgiving thousands. There are 13 attributes listed where our Father shows in the midst of our sinfulness, in the midst of our problems, where we are at, our Father will come and atonement will be made so that we can be brought into His presence. And then we are instructed to build a Mishkan into a 35 to 40. And in the beginning of Leviticus, we deal with the sacrifices that we as a nation brings and that the priesthood facilitate worship. And um, then on the eighth day, when the priest, priest started to perform this function and entered the tabernacle, this was Leviticus 8 to 10, and we know that's where Nadav and Abihu had their demise. So the question is, based on, not that one, this one, based on that experience there of a priesthood that was thoroughly instructed in all the right things to do, what to do, what not to do, the protocols were theirs. They knew that by heart. How could they have missed it? And not if an Abihu had to die in the presence of our father. How could that happen? So what the father does is he says, initially, right there at the top, right there at, in Exodus 19, who did he say, if you will hear my voice and obey my commandments, then you will be a set-apart nation? To whom did he say that? To the whole of the house, to the whole of Israel, not only to the priesthood. He said that to the whole house, so that we can, so that Israel can be a light to the nations, a priesthood to the nations. But because of what happened subsequently, the Levitical priesthood was set apart to perform the function. So, now the question is, is how do we live and move and have our being in our Father? With His presence residing in our lives in the camp. Because suddenly we are coming from learning about Him, He's there, 
suddenly he's with us and he's within us. And this is the, this is the area that we, oops, sorry, sorry about that. Um, we're going in the totally dong, wrong direction. Where are we? I still need to get to know this thing. Here we are. Okay. So we are moving into a place where we are living a life of peace with the Father. That's where, that's where we are. And uh, it's slightly, I see in this one, it's slightly compressed menorah. I hope you like the design. Uh, James uh, showed this slide to us last week. And just as a foundation, I just would like to refer to that again. And he, he uh, spoke about it in detail. I'm going to just rush through it. And remember, Psalm 18 is a, is a nice chiastic structure. And we start at the outside. We start at the outside. <laughs> it's interesting. Okay, verse 1 to 3. It says, where you proclaim your love to the Father. He says, David says, remember that word for love there is racham. It's, I, com I compassion you, Father. That's what, that's what the word says. And he says, he proclaims that, that Yeshua is with him. And because I love you, Father, and I know Yeshua is with me, at the end, verse 49 to 50, I will sing praise to your name and I will glorify you. And then we, our relationship is circular and it's going to the core because the next thing we realize in verse 17 to 19, I would like to show it to you there. No, not there, there. Verse 17 to 19, we realize that the Father brought us out and he purchased us. And verse 37 at the end, second from the end says, I know because I am yours and you are within me, my enemies, you will overtake my enemies. And the next level in verse 20, we realize that as we walk on the relationship that's been established between us and the Father, righteousness is our portion. And as we are coming closer and closer to his presence, our Yeshua, our righteousness, the one that is established in the relationship with us. If we walk according to his example in verse 24, we will draw near to the Father and we will be prepared to enter into that relationship, that set-apart relationship that Peter and his friends knew all about. And we are called to the middle to be tamim, to be perfect before him. And this is the story of Tazria and, and Metzorah is to call us from the outsides of our, where we find ourselves away from the presence of the Father to be brought near into a nation that can become the priesthood that he had in mind. The same story of the, of the festivals starts at a covenantal relationship with the Father where we enter into covenant and then associate with the sinless life of Messiah, recognize him as the first fruit and then equipped with spirit and truth so that we can be a testimony in the summertime to the nations around us. And then there's a day of shouting that comes where we call each other closer. And it's a message to, uh, to ourselves and to the nation around us to say, let's make repentance, let's make teshuva so that we are prepared for that day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, so that we can dwell in Sukkot together. Two pictures are one. But it, 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 um, the Father's initiated this process by all that the whole plan of salvation that He has put before us. It's our responsibility to walk closer to Him. And this is what we are talking about today. So, Leviticus, from 11, actually, from the beginning of Leviticus 11, Vaikra 11, it is a becomes quite graphic as we read through the portion this morning as well. From 11 to 19, Nish, is it the portion that our practical lives, we as humans, how do we live this life here? In the presence of the Father. So that it is, brings pleasure to Him. That we don't contaminate or pollute ourselves with things that is, his presence isn't welcome with. That we're not welcome in his presence. Probably. So, as the, wilder, as the Mishkan was his dwelling place in the wilderness, so we are the, the Mishkan right now. So those things are, not, the, the things that we've read about this morning, it's not only applicable to 
to um, generations, 3,000 people living 3,000 years ago, it is applicable to us here today. So we must know what it meant and the, in, and the intention of what it meant so that we can live a life that brings pleasure to the Father. Because remember, the moment that we say yes to the Father, Ushiana Adonai, save me, and the Spirit comes and indwell me, then what we do is in this little tabernacle standing here as we are hosting the King. So now that we host the King, how do we live our lives so that He is welcome in everything we do? So there's a change in our lives that must be brought. We cannot just continue. Something must change. The second half of Exodus, the, the story changes. From the beginning of Genesis to the second half of, or to the end of the first half of Exodus, it's a, it's a story that's told. A story where the Father intervenes in the lives of the people that He has put on the earth so that we can understand Him. We can understand Him better. But from the second half of, of, um, of Exodus to where we are now, those words are the most repeated words. Vayedaber Adonai el Moshe, and the Father said unto Moses, Tell the children of Israel to do this. So there are two types of revelation in the Torah that we're talking about. Firstly, there's inspired, uh, an inspired story that's told. Secondly, it is the words of the Father that we hear. I think it's important if we hear the words of the Father to apply it to our lives. And what we are working through at the moment. I think in, it said in Vayikra 12 verse 1, those words, Vayidabar Adonai El Moshe, in 14 verse 1, it's repeated all over. It says, the Father says directly to Moses, go and say these words to Israel. So we need to hear those words and we need to work through it in our lives. If we work through this book of Vayikra, when did we start? I'm trying to think. When did we start with reading Vaikra in terms of our recent experience? It was the week before Pesach. It was the week before Pesach and the week before Shavuot, Vaikra finishes. So in this whole time of counting the Omer, in, during this whole period of Pesach to Shavuot, our preparation to receive the Word and the Spirit, we read the Book of Holiness. How to facilitate the presence of our Father, the Spirit of our Father in our lives. So I think it's important to understand. And I think we need to, we need to speak about what it means. And all I want to do today is speak about Kadosh, Tahor, and Tamay. Those three concepts. You know, it's important for us to understand. So that's all I want to do. I think if we can live in that in the reality of Shavuot, being equipped with the Spirit and the truth, then we've got two legs to stand on. We can walk, Spirit and truth, Spirit, so that we can walk in the, in the fields that's prepared for harvest, and that the Father's harvest can be full, and that His kingdom can be built in our lives. So, apparently it is important, because if you read the Psalms, 119 verse 160, it says, Father, the entirety of your word is truth. And in every hour and in every one of your righteous judgment endures forever. The prophet Isaiah and Peter says, the word of a father endures forever. Paul says in Timothy, all scriptures from Bereshit is given by the inspiration of our father and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. How much of that needs to be applied in our lives and worked through? Doctrine we understand. That's the ways that we live. Look at the rest. When we miss it, what do we do? We are reproved. That's correction, remember? That is to say you need to make teshuva. Turn around, going in the wrong direction. Be corrected in what you do so that we can have instruction in righteousness. You remember that menorah that I showed you? What is the most inner, the two testimonies next to the word that we must live out? It is living in righteousness. 
So that's what our lives are being cleansed and purified as we are going along. That's what's important. So what we are looking at today is 12 to 15. And this is the instructions on living a life that, ple bring, that pleases the Father. Ezekiel says, the priests, who are priests here, by the way? Who are priests? Anyone priests? Priests? Kohenim? Priests? I see three. Well, just hold up your hands. I just want to identify. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, six. All right. Great. Six of us are priests. You know. Okay. Let me rephrase the question. Who of you are priests in the order of Melchizedek? Now we've got a couple more. Great. We've got potential for growth. There's about 20 that's not. All right. So Leviticus 10.10 10 says, You as the priests, the guys that are priests and the girls that are priests, you've got a function. And it is that you may put a difference between what's holy and what's unholy, between clean, unclean and clean. That's it. Okay? That's your function. If you are a priest... I'm not going to have you put up your hands again. But if the, you know who are priests. If you are priests, then we should understand, have a firm understanding of what is holy, unholy, clean and unclean. Okay? Because that's, our, that's what we should do. So, what is the counter? Can one of the priests answer this? What is the counter to be holy? No, yeah, what's the other side of the... What is the counter of that? What's, go, what's the counter of holy? Oh, it says it there. Oops, Daisy. Oops, Daisy. It says between the holy and profane or the holy and unholy. Okay, holy and unholy. What does unholy sound to you like? What does it sound to you like? Unholy. You live an unholy life. What is that? Profaned. Sinful sort of a deal. Don't you think? Does it sound like it? So what is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Is it holy or unholy? It's unholy. Because it's common. Remember? You've got the only difference is the translation says holy and unholy. It's a difference between what is set apart and what's common. Okay. So the counter of holy is common, really. Okay? So. Clean and unclean. Was the, the, the ideas of Tamay Tahor, clean and unclean to do for temple times, temple worship times. It was to be understood in those days of worship to the temple. But what about us now? What about us? Does it apply to our lives? Tamay Tahor? You know? I wonder if it's still... Can I have a show of hands? Let's, have a, let's vote. Let's say. What do you think? Democracy. Is it, is it applicable to our lives? Okay. All right. <clears throat> we won't make that an official counter. So, I thought the best way to do it is there are three things. Now, set, set apart. No, no, okay. Is, let me, let me go back. Can I ask? Holy and to be clean, Tahor, is that standing next to each other? Is that the same thing? Holy, clean, unholy, unclean. Is that the categories? You think? I'm seeing ideas. So the, way, the only way I can explain it is you've got, an, you've got a concept of to be set apart. To be set apart. Kadosh, to be holy. And then an idea of to be clean, common, clean, tahor, or, or, or common, and then unclean. Three, three categories. Okay? So you can be clean, but not set apart. You can be unclean, not either of one of the two. If you're unclean, you're unclean. But it's, if you are set apart, or kodesh, is it equal to be clean or common? Is it clean? Okay, so we know to be set apart is to be complete, 
to be morally pure. That's why David says, One thing I have asked of you, Tevafe, is that I will seek after, is that I may dwell in the house of Jehovah all the days of my life, and to behold His beauty, and to inquire, to be able to ask the questions, what must my life be like in His temple? So if you live a life of being set apart, that's what your heart is. Is to put everything, your whole life, in perspective of, how can I live my life to achieve that? Is to inquire in His temple, to live gazing on the beauty of Jehovah. That's what, that's what it means. Your life is focused on one aspect. And this is to bring pleasure to our Father and to live that life. Okay? Now, before I go there. Nada van Abihu. Think about them. What were they? Were they unclean? Remember they were killed. Were they clean or set apart? What do you think? I'm looking for some ideas here. What do you think? Was, were they set apart, clean or unclean? The father wanted them to be set apart. Were they clean? They entered the tabernacle. They were clean. Of course, they were clean for seven days. The period, the, the short, the, I think the longest, no, could be careful what I say. A man, when he's, con he's con been contaminated with death, the longest period he can be, be taken away from the presence is seven days. So for seven days, they are washed, they are whatever they were, to be able to be thoroughly clean, ceremonially clean, to be able to enter the presence of the Father. And then, because they were set apart by the nation and by our Father to facilitate worship, of course they were set apart. Yet when they entered the, the, the tabernacle and they did what they shouldn't have done, we know they were carried out by the tunics. You know? So, in our set-apartness, we shouldn't live a life where, where any, anything like pride or anything creeps in and causes problems because the closest we the closer we get to our father the more severe it becomes the more intense our relationship becomes okay to be clean is we see the psalm writer 19 says the fear of adonai is tahor it's clean enduring forever he's mishpatim of Adonai are true and righteous altogether. So we live in the fear of Adonai. We know he's our, we will live a life of being cleaned forever. The judgments of our Father are true and righteous. Can you see that Psalm 18 menorah working? We come from joy, praise, and then our enemies are conquered and righteousness in our lives to the center where we are equipped at Shavuot so that we can go out and proclaim the goodness and the mercy and spirit and in truth. So, the fear of Adonai is in the middle. The judgments of our Father are righteous altogether. And what about the bottom one? Unclean. Where does that function in the tem in a tabernacle set up? We're in the tabernacle. This is a question. Simple answer. Where in the tabernacle does uncleanness function? One place. Outside. Jesus, is that. So not even just outside. It's outside, outside. Because if you are found to be unclean, you are to dwell, you are in lockdown. I'm sorry. That's how it works. You are in lockdown in your own tent. We read through the story of Metzorah this morning. And what happens if you think you've got tarat, you've got um, a problem, a scab, a red, a red swelling that becomes the inverse and a white hair grows? I don't know if you all knows what that means, but it's when that happens to you, you inquire of the priest and he will come to your tent and he will say, I'm not sure, sit there for seven days. Withdraw from the community, sit there for seven days. After seven days, call me. No call out fee. You will come there and you will look at what's happening. And if it grows, if the swelling spreads, if the scab spreads, he will proclaim 
tamay and um, you will be put you will be remain in your tent for another seven days so 14 days is a rather sort of standard period that you are spending in your tent and then when you are found to be of tzara'at is part of your life where do you go then my lovely outside outside of the camp because you've got time tzara'at is a is a spiritual condition manifesting on your skin and it resembles the willingness to make teshuva if you're unwilling to make teshuva if you don't turn around come back if you don't repent it will grow into tzara'at if you repent 14 days is enough will be restored so let's quickly speak about what it means to be clean it says in Psalm 51 I think Anneli was about there this morning create in me a clean heart O Adonai and renew a steadfast spirit within me do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Ruach HaKodesh from me restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit can you see Psalm 18, the structure of Psalm 8? Man, all over I see that this morning. What's going on? It says, outside, the furthest portion, salvation and sustenance from the outside. And it's coming in closer and closer to the place where we have got a tahor. You know what the Hebrew doesn't... The reason why Hebrew is such an easy language to learn is it's because it's very, very logic. It says, it starts with, I need to point that out, but I can't. Oh, hang on, I've got it there. There it is. It starts on the outside. It says, Lev tahor barali Elohim, v'ruach nachon chadash bekirbi. I think it's chadash. Chadash bekirbi. I wish I could show this to you. Start from the right hand side. It starts with what's important. What it what has David? What was the need of David? Primarily, he needed a heart. He needed a heart. He knew that the father is not in the re, in the renovation business. That's not what father does. If you've got a filthy, dirty heart, you can't take that heart and just clean it. He needs to give you a new heart. So he starts with heart. He says, "Lev tahor barali, Father, give me a heart that is clean, tahor." And don't just make it over. It says, Bara, create in me a new heart. Elohim. And Varuach, and the spirit, Nachon, to establish, to make, to make it to endure. Chadash. Chadash is to make new. Bekirbi. Bekirbi is within me. So, that's why it's so easy. You see, the, the sequence. It's very logical. It starts with heart, heart, uh, create in me a God. And then it goes to, you know, so if you try to get the English and the Hebrew together, it's a very easy process. So the thing is, the bottom line there is, we need a new house. I can't with my own soulish desires and soulish things overcome myself just doesn't work that's when you decide to make a change in your life because this way that you live you know is wrong what happens in two days you do the same thing in three days five days same story so that's why David knowing this he says father it's up to you and I declare my total dependency on you create in me a new heart create in me a new heart and a steadfast spirit because the last thing that I would like to be done is to be taken outside of the camp, to be casted away from your presence. But I want to be restored so that I can enter your tabernacle and to bring sacrifices before you. So that's the need for regeneration. That's why our spirits need to be regenerated. That leads to eventual rebirth. Okay, you've got the concept. When you come to the Father and you, you come to the process of salvation, Pesach, you get to establishing the, the, the newness of our Father. You are sealed from, from death to life. 
And now the Father lives within you through His Spirit. You're sealed with the Spirit, uh, Shaul says. And we are awaiting our final our rebirth in the kingdom. We are rebirthed in spirit, soul, and body. Now our spirits are just regenerated. Okay, so we've got that. So if we think about the concept, today's portion, if you think about Sarah'at, leprosy. Don't confuse it with Hansen's disease. It's not the same thing. Hansen's disease, leprosy that we know about today, only come, came in hundreds of years later from India. This wasn't Hansen's disease. This was Tara'at. You can easily identify the two. The one is Hebrew, the other one is not. You see? So, Tara'at. It's a skin condition. It's a spiritual condition manifesting on your skin. So, the principle here of Tara'at, of becoming unclean, is, do you remember the diagram that I showed you? Holy, clean, uh, of holy, set apart, clean and unclean. Unclean and holy can never touch. You can never bring the one with the other. And the moment you suspect any contamination, any movement away from being clean to unclean, you withdraw in your tent and you call the priest. And you say, I suspect that I'm getting to be unclean. Help me. Come and investigate and see if this is the case. Because the last thing I want to do is to go into the presence of the Father and bring pollution. That's the last thing that I want to do. For my own sake and for the sake of the presence of the Father in the camp. So, so if you look at the process that's happening, where we should function, where our lives normally function, we as believers, is in a clean state. Okay? We live a life that's clean, according to the instructions of the Father, and where we are dealing with our lives Sunday to Friday. That's what we do. Okay? So, we are a people that is called by His name to be set apart in all of our ways. And I think we are, as we mature and as we grow closer and as we are living a life closer and closer to the Father. We are becoming more and more set apart, to becoming totally set apart. I'm wondering, as I'm thinking of Peter and his friends walking around in town, everybody knows Peter and the rest of the guys are coming to town and we line up our needs. So, why 2,000 years later are we not a, sp a light on a, of a city on a hill, uh, more like a decorative night light on your bed, Kasi. You know, why has this happened to us? Why has this happened that we, that we are, that we don't have that testimony again anymore? And I think Chris has asked that that question a lot of times, and it's a relevant question: is why? Has it happened to us that, that our lights are so dim? I think it is our need for restoration to the place where Peter and the other disciples... Remember, Peter and the other eleven was, were his apostles. And I think, think we need to distinguish between the apostles and the disciples. I think there is a level of authority that was set there. But the, but the, the testimony of the disciples and the testimony of the people that walked the earth in the time of Messiah and believers. And as we see in the, in the difficult places where our Father's word is, the, is suppressed and there are people standing up and proclaiming His name with their, with their own lives at stake, we see that the goodness and the glory and the mercy of the Father is shone forth. But I think um, for thousands of years now, our testimony of righteousness and being set apart has been diminished to a large extent. And I think that's why we are where we are at. So the Father calls us unto restoration. Restore these things in your life so that you can shine like a light of a city on a hilltop. Don't put it under a... A... a what's it on? A bucket. What is the word? What's the right word? There's a word. A bushel, natuurlijk, man. So, I still don't know what a bushel is. It must be a bucket. Anyway, so, 
Because that is the thing. Create in me a clean heart, O oh Father, so that we can grow into a testimony of holiness. So what happens to us is when we are set apart and holy. Let's take Tara'at, for example. Let's take this, this portion that we're in. A man, it says Ha'ish, a man of the camp that's clean, contaminated. Normally, the men in the camp or the people in the camp are called to bring, remember we just read from Leviticus 1 to 7, we are called to bring the five korbanot, the, the burnt offering, the mincha, the meal offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the asham, the guilt offering. This is the way we are, we are worshipping the Father and coming into His presence because three of those are said to be Kodesh Kodeshim, most holy for the Israelite. That's the most holy place, like the most holy place for the Levitical priest. This is most holy for an Israelite. So one of those men suddenly gets tzara'at. He suspects himself to have a spot or a blemish. I spoke about this this morning in, in the prayer before. Ephesians says, what is Messiah's purpose? To wash us with his word. To prepare us like a bride without spot, wrinkle or blemish. He is to take the tzara out from your life and my life. Because all of us has got blemishes. And through our experiences in life, as we are going through difficult days, he, take, he exposes that little spot that you haven't seen before and cleanses it. I've got 28 slides. I should go. So, then there's a, the story of common. Now, there's clean and common. Same level. You've got common days, Sunday to Friday. You're clean if you live a life that the Father has called you to live. But the word for common in Hebrew is chol. Now, I looked at what it could mean, and it says it's a place or a person that is not set apart for a specific function. Is that bad? No. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you can do anything as long as it's clean. All right? But it's not for a specific pur purpose. A uh, earring is a choli. You see, all of them comes from the same root, same word. A choli, an earring, is an ornament that's pushed through a hole. Okay? So, the ear is set apart for hearing. And now you push an earring through it, it becomes clean. There's nothing wrong with it. But... It's got a dual purpose now. You can hear with it, and it looks pretty. You see, it's got a earring in it. It's not set apart for hearing anymore. It's got a dual purpose. Choli. To begin. Estachala. It is begin. Which of you have ever tried to drill a hole in a metal sheet around this? Sort of a metal pipe. Let's call it a pipe. Take a three millimeter drill and try to drill a hole. What happens? It just slip. You can't ever drill a hole in a pipe. Because that thing is holy. <laughs> to, make it, to make it common, you know what you do? You know what you do? As you take a punch and a hammer and you mark it. Now the pipe is marked. It's common. You can, what you can now do is to remove its purpose completely and drill a hole in it. And the water will, will run out. It becomes unclean. So there's a progression or there's a regression from being totally set apart, marked by a punch, and then you can go down. To bore. Oh, you see, that proves my point. Anything that is bored through like a hole in the ear or whatever it is. A window is a chalon. Not the measure of the Americans. It's a different chalon. It is a window. You've got a hole like, you've got a wall like that wall. And now suddenly you've put a window in that. It is not as strong as it used to be. Okay? If the enemy approaches, there's a hole in the bucket. Oh, uh, the wall. Dear Lila. So, so that is the, the idea of being common. It's, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not completely set apart for the one purpose only, 
anymore. Okay, so four times in the Tanakh we have a verse that contrasts to be common and kadosh. That contrasts to be holy and clean. Ah, uh, yeah, clean, whole, common actually. Because remember on that same middle level you've got actually two ideas. You've got on the one side you've got tahor, that means clean. And on the other side you've got the spiritual idea that is chol. No, it's common. All right? You hear what I'm saying? I hope so. Leviticus 10.10 10 says, And that you may put the difference between holy, or the unholy, which is still clean, but it's common, and between unclean and clean. So, if we think about that word halal, I think it's halal, it means to bore or pierce, remember what I said? Ezekiel says, it is when you are carefully bored through by a sword, it is the word mechuleli cherev, because it means that you have been pierced by a sword. Okay? It is the word halil is a flute. So it's an instrument that's got holes in it. It's now a flute. And um, lechem chol is common bread. It's normal bread. It's not the set of sacred bread of a tabernacle. It's common bread. So you can see most of these has got nothing wrong with it. There's a weapon there. That's called the Khalil. I wonder, that is, that is the Israeli weapon where we got an awful from. So that's a different type of wind instrument, a flute. Okay, it's a wind instrument, different purpose. So, but Khalil means to pollute or defile or desecrate. So it takes away from what is holy in your life. And so the next level is, if you are walking a life of total set-apartness before the Father, you are, you are walking and focusing on Him only, and something happens in your life, which is not sinful, but distracts you completely, and it makes you walk away from that set-apartness, then to a measure you have been defiled, and now you are becoming just clean. 1 Samuel says, The priest answered David and said, There is no common bread. There is no lechem chol under my hand. But there is the set-apart bread of the presence of our Father, the bread of the presence. And if the young men have kept themselves, at least from women. So what, what was the prerequisite of the men of David to eat from the sacred bread, from the bread of His presence that came out of the tabernacle? They had to be clean. If they were unclean, no go. You'd go hungry. So they could only eat of that bread when they were clean. Because you are not allowed to touch anything from the tabernacle or resembling worship in an unclean state. So let's just think about that, that story again. We come from set apart, and there is a, a measure of if you're not set up, if you are walking away from that in somewhere in your life, it's a process of profaning. You go to becoming a clean, and if you are so, Saturday. Oh, so let's say Shabbat, set apart. Sunday, clean, common. But if you do something on a Sunday that is not according to the word of the Father, what happens to that Sunday? It becomes unclean for you. It's at last level. It becomes sinful. There's a way back though. There's a way back of cleansing. What was the cleansing way of the, of the person of Tzara'at, of the leper? What happened to him? If the priest proclaims him now healed from Tzara'at, he comes, he lives outside the camp, he puts his hand up, he calls the priest, the priest comes and inspects him, he says, you are no more unclean, you are clean. What happens to him? He comes back into the camp, he needs to shave off all the, his bodily hair, he needs to wash his clothes, his garment, put away for seven days, the priest comes, inspects, a whole process. At the end, after he has physically cleaned himself, the priest says, you're fine. What then? He puts uh, blood on him, different places, so that spiritually he's cleansed as well. So there's a way back, and the way is cleansing and consecration. So it is, in our lives this happens, and it does happen that you do something. Do you remember this week? Driving around in town, <laughs> suddenly someone rides in front of you. <laughs> Yay, yo, far bond. You remember that thing? If you go beyond Farnborn, there's cleansing and consecration that needs to be done. Remember? So, 
came from Frank with my motorbike, and an old woman doesn't see me around the circle, and I had to go over the circle to avoid him. Marius always says, when something like that happens, just go, well, hallelujah anyway. <laughs> you know, so we try to go that way, hallelujah anyway. So, so repentance and sacrifice brings us back to life. And that's where we should be. Because remember, there are three gates to the tabernacle. The way, the truth, and the life. The third gate of life is our final destination. It is the presence of our Father. But Yeshua facilitates those three, being the way, the truth, and the life. So in Messiah, we should repent and bring the Romans 1, Romans 12, one sacrifice, a living sacrifice. What is the difference between these sacrifices and the Romans 12 sacrifice? The sacrifices that's brought into the tabernacle, what's the one common thing that they've got in common? They all die. What does the Romans 12 sacrifice do? It lives. So you bring yourself as a living sacrifice daily, every day, so that you can have a life before the Father. The opposite is true. If, uh, if you hit the woman on the other side of the circle and you hit him repeatedly, then, you f then sin and death happens. And you're away from the presence of the Father. That's the, that's the problem. So it's so easy for us to go through these cycles of life. And what we aim for, really, is to dwell here and progressively grow from that perspective up into live a life of total set-apartness before the Father. That's where we're aiming for. Leviticus 13.2 says, When a man is on his skin, a body is swelling, a scab or a bright spot, and it shall become on the skin like a leprous infection, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of the sons the priests. So it's those guys. This is not a sickness that you can really see with eyesight. This is a discernment that a spiritual person makes to say, I've got a problem in my life that I need to deal with to, re and to bring back the full shalom between me and the Father. So, seven days, seven days. If it spreads, what do you do if it spreads? What does the word say? What do you do when, if it spreads after the 14 days and it puts out, put outside of the camp? What do you do? Simple. Put a mask on. You say, Tamei, 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 as you walk around outside of town. You cover your upper lip. It says you cover your upper lip. So I'm wondering, what happened in the world? Was it the proclamation of being Tamei? I wonder. Because to a large extent, we are outside of the camp of the Father. You know? I don't know, there must be a purpose for everything. I'm not sure. This is not a doctrine, it's not anything, it's a, maybe just a remark. All right. Don't send me emails, it's not a problem. So, the interesting thing is, if he is completely covered with white, with white scabs, what happens then to you? You're clean. How can you be clean? Why is a person that's completely covered with tzara'at clean? What do you think? You know what the problem is? Is that if you've got a spot and you cover it, nobody knows, and you walk around camp, then you are not healed inside. And every, nobody knows that you've got a problem. And you spread tzara'at by what you say in the camp. But if you're completely infected, everybody knows. You've got Sarah But if raw flesh starts appearing, we read this morning, starts appearing, then you will know that that thing is infectious and is dangerous. You're unclean. Outside of the camp, are you? This whole story of Sarah is, is, is so much more of a spiritual picture than a physical picture. It's difficult for us because it doesn't function in our lives anymore to understand. But it draws a nice picture. And this portion of Scripture from, from 12 to 19 is so graphic 
it's almost dangerous to read it in a mixed community. You know? So. So if we get to back to this story, a person with tzara'at is down at the bottom and it's up to him to recognize his problem, his sin, and to call the priest so that he can be cleansed, to repent, to return, to make teshuva, and then he can receive his cleansing. And when he is cleansed, reach a state of, the, of what the Israelite is called to live in a state of cleanness, then he can have a consecration time for him so that he can worship back in the tabernacle again. That's our calling, is to identify the, pra- the places in our lives that has got problems so that we can be reinstated into a life of total peace before our Father. So Tamei, if you're in a state of Tamei, it is the bottom this is, a, this is typically a person that hasn't met a father before, that lives in uncleanness, a life of hopelessness. And our purpose is, as holy, as set-apart people living in a state of cleanness, is to show them a lifestyle. Matthew 28 says it. In your going, every day as you go, drive down the street, you meet a friend, maybe your friend is unclean. Bring him close to you so that he can walk with you. And as he see that your life is clean, he asks you a question. How can I get to the state where you are functioning in? And I say, let me introduce you to the light and the life of Messiah. And you baptize him, wash him clean. And after that, start to teach him. That's what Matthew 28 says. We usually do it the other way around, unsuccessfully. So... But for someone that's got uncleanness, the tabernacle, the functioning of the tabernacle is dead in that state. Remember Jeremiah said, the father says to Israel, he says, I've got no pleasure in your festivals, in whatever you do of worship, because it's dead. It's removed from my presence. So, Jeremiah 23, 11 says, For both the prophet and the priest are polluted. Even in my house I have found... Their wickedness, Tzara'at. And the father is desperately unhappy with them. Everybody, the priests and the prophets are polluted, unclean. And we are just going on because of religion, not of, because of relationship with our father through Messiah. Jeremiah says, although you wash yourself with lye and use as much soap as you can, the stain of your iniquity is before me. So don't just come from uncleanness to trying to wash your way up. It is a spiritual cleaning through teshuva, through repentance, through recognizing where we're at, so that we can be reinstated to the functioning of the temple. John 3, 13, John 13, 11 says, For he knew the one who was betraying him, for the reason he said, Not all of you are clean. Who were clean? Eleven disciples were clean. There was one functioning, walking with Messiah that is unclean. So, Acts 10, 27, 10, 27 says, As he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. Who was that? Who was that going in as he talked with him? It was Peter. Peter received a vision of a sheet with all sorts of creepy crawlies that the father instructed him to eat. And he says... I cannot. But now in verse 27, he says what he understood it to mean. He says, and as Peter talked with Cornelius, he went in and found many persons, not from Judah, many people gathered. And he said to them, you selves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or visit anyone from another nation. Why? Because of Tamei. This is the reason. But our Father has shown me that I should not call any person common or clean, common or unclean. I can't make the distinction. So if we meet a fellow believer, because that's who Cornelius and the people was, that was assembled there, and we make a decision or a interpretation that that person is unclean because of another expression of faith, 
Just remember this verse. It says, But our Father has shown me that I should not call a person common or unclean. Leave it up to Him. Just introduce Messiah to them and speak about the Father and speak to them about life and light. And we will restore this picture to where we should function up there. So, the Father says in 1 Peter, or Peter says in 1 Peter, in inspiration of the Spirit, and in Leviticus and Exodus, it says, Be set apart, right there at the top, right there. Be holy as I am holy. Why is that call? So that we can have perfect relationship and, fun and fellowship with the Father. Because if we're down at the bottom, we're removed from His presence and we cannot be with Him. The more we set our lives apart, the more we live a life of His presence, and it doesn't mean head knowledge. It doesn't mean we need to understand anything better. It is a life of selfless life before our Father, so that we can put our lives down, so that we can bring others in relationship with the Father. So, as we do that, our Father says, you are, you are becoming more like what I intended you to become. Malachi says, and this is the life of Levi, the priest. My covenant was with Levi, was for life and peace. So, if you're a priest, it says, my covenant is with you for life and peace. And I gave them to him to fear, and he feared me, and he stood in awe of my name. And the Torah of truth was in his mouth, and unrighteousness was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and in straightness, and turned many away from crookedness. Man, if that can be our testimony. Isn't that a wonderful testimony? This is the way we should live our lives. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge. And they seek the Torah from his mouth, for he is a messenger of Adonai of hosts. So if we live a life like that, know who we are? We become, if we are seeking the Torah, they will seek the Torah from the priest's mouth, for the priest is a messenger of Adonai of hosts. So may that be our portion, that we can walk a life, live a life of the testimony of Malachi 2. So, are we priests? Is this our lives? Is this is is that what is? Are these our the testimony of our lives as we live a life in community? It's a little bit of a challenge. I think there's room for growth. I've just got a couple of verses that speaks about this idea from the from the apostolic scriptures, so that if we thought that this notion was only applicable for temple times, look at this. It says, God did not know, did not call us to be tamay, to be unclean, but called us to be set apart, to be holy. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but he rejects our Father, who has also given us his Ruach HaKodesh. So if we reject his righteousness, his judgments, the things that he set apart for us to live our lives in so that we can resemble a life of peace with Him. It is a Father that we reject. So, Romans 1 says, because although they knew God, they knew all the scriptures, they knew the things that they needed to do, they did not glorify Him as Elohim, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and foolish. Their foolish hearts were darkened. What is the opposite of foolish? Wise. Where do we find our wisdom? It says that the word of our Father is our wisdom. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. It is when we bring the words and the ways and the ideas that our Father has imparted to us to, down to the level of man that we corrupt His word and the sanctity of it. So, Therefore our Father has given them up to be tamay in the lusts of their hearts, so they dishonor their bodies among themselves. So, if we live a life that is void of the judgments, of the things that our Father, if we void the life of the things that our Messiah loved, and we 
then we are in trouble. So, Romans 1 says, Come out from them and be set apart. Be holy, says Adonai. Touch no tamay thing and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let's purify ourselves. You remember from the bottom? Look your way up. Let's purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and the spirit. First you wash the body, like a Sarah person, you wash the body. But remember there's a spiritual aspect. Perfecting set-apartness. And why do we do that? Because of reverence for our Father. In fear lest I come, Paul says, and I will not find you such as I wish, and I will, that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish. So, as ek jylle nie kreis, as ek wil wees nie, gaan jylle ervaar wat jylle nie wil ervaar nie, sê oom Paul. Okay, so, and I shall mourn at the bottom, it says, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned, but otherwise they haven't applied the ways of our Father. So mourn for many who have sinned and have not repented of uncleanness. Remember, that's why a person started to experience leprosy, tzara'at. It's because he didn't engage in the system where you can deal with your uncleanness, bring it to the Father, you kept it for yourself. And then you become unclean to the point of receiving uh, leprosy and you're put outside of the camp. So who have sinned before and not repented of the uncleanness, fornication and lewdness have practiced. Ephesians says, For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man, nor he who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Messiah. So this story, that's why a priest is to proclaim what is holy and unholy, what's clean and unclean. Because this is crucial. It's, it's, a, it's really crucial. So I'm going to skip over the rest. The New Testament is full of this stuff. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident. There's lots of them. It shows uncleanness. And those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's our calling to, if you identify, we are building up to the time of Shavuot to receive the Spirit and the Word of our Father. And if anything is of this, like this, that points to this sort of dissensions, listen, it's not all stuff that's very foreign to us. Let's just quickly work through it. Sorcery, yeah. Maybe that's foreign. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. Those things are sort of outside of our perspective. Hatred, contention, jealousies, outbursts, frost, selfish ambitions. Gets closer to home. And those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's why Ephesians 6 says, Messiah is preparing a bride for himself, washing them in the water of the word to clean them from these things. That's what he's doing. Remember this picture? Generally we are functioning in that area if we are not engaging in Stuff that we shouldn't. Our calling is to live a total set-apart life before the Father and not even approach anything that's unclean. Do you remember what are the unclean things again from, from this perspective? You know, that list? That's a difficult list because that list applies to your life and my life. I'll have to ask that Omi um forgiveness. Okay. So... The potential of sustained uncleanness. I'm only at, where am I? Okay. Are you comfortable? <clears throat> I'm sorry. So, this is what I said before. I think if we, over the thousands of hundreds and thousands of years since Messiah has, dwell, has walked away from the things that were precious from his sight, this is why we are not a brilliant light of a standing on the hillside. We became a bedside lampy. So, remember, if we study the word and we and our vision, that what we hear and that what we see and interpret and and realize what the Father is, if that increases, 
then our spiritual vision increases, but our responsibility increases as well. You know? So it's as we learn the character of the Father, our responsibility increases. And we need to... The wisdom and the knowledge that the Father interprets or gives to us, we are responsible for that. That's why uh, James and I, so we were driving the other day, and um, I said to him, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I dread, really, is to have a talk like this recorded. It's on the internet. It's out there. People hear it. I'm responsible for that. I'm responsible for speaking these words to live a life that resembles that. And so are you. So are all of us. We are called into a life of worship to come as close to the presence of the Father, in the presence of the Father. And that's our responsibility. So, priest duties, last slide. Leviticus 10 says, You and your son are not to drink wine or strong drink. Like ever? Let's just stop there now. Wine or strong drink, ever. What is the word for wine, just before we get confused? The word for wine there. It's yayin. It's fermented wine. Or strong drink. That's the other stuff. <clears throat> when you enter the tent of meeting. So, or else you will die. This is a permanent statute for the generations of the... So, Move the things that are common and move the things that are holy. So get a proper perspective. You must distinguish between what's holy and what's common. Between the clean and the unclean so that you may teach the nation all the statutes of our Father that He has given through Moses. So what's our calling then? It's our calling is to live a life that through our lives the teaching of what's holy and what is clean and unclean will be seen. That's our calling. Not the, not the words that we use and the clever things that we can say, but to live a life that draws people to the presence of the Father. That's our, that's, that's our calling. Do you think we've got some potential that we can maybe grow towards? I think, maybe. So let's get back to Sian's question. Teruah, shouting. Why do we shout? We can all shout. I mean, I'm sure we can. But why do we shout at the time of Yom Teruah? It's because Yom Teruah follows Shavuot. So we receive the Spirit and the Word at Shavuot. In a couple of weeks down the line now. Then we are thoroughly equipped for the work in the kingdom, to bring in the harvest. But some of us do not deal with the uncleanness in our lives. Most of us, I think. And we are to proclaim those things before the Father. Because that teruah is a shout of a cry for help. It is a cry to say, Father, help me. Because the things that is in this little this terra firma that stands in number nine shoes, there are aspects of my life that needs cleansing you know so maybe we can shout why don't we you know what do we shout to? teruah the word teruah the, is the blowing of a trumpet the blowing of I gave a shofar to Um Christo. it is the blowing of a trumpet so I'm going to ask Um Christo to blow the trumpet I hope Um Christo you can blow that so far. I know it's not yours. But as Um Christo is blowing that trumpet, it's an opportunity for each of us to ask the Father. For the one thing, if I'm speaking about the one thing that, that you know causes a stumbling block in your life and you worship to the Father, you know there's a thing. That's the thing that you ask the Father to get rid of your life, from your life while we are doing this. Right. So let's just stand. I think this is a moment that can be... You know what happens? Before Christ blows the trumpet, you know what happens? What's our risk in life? 
as we go down this road that the Father has called us to go down, and we go down at speed and we see a turn off. You know, you're browsing the internet. You know, I've got two screens in my, on my computer, and I'm doing studies and all sorts of things on this screen. My eye catches a new WR450 standing on that screen. You know what happens? Is I'm sidetracked. And my soul, there's a portion of me that's going down that road while I'm proceeding in this direction. And it diminishes me. It takes away from my faith. It takes away from the full expression of we are in the presence of the Father. So the areas of your life that is away from the calling of, of our Father, let's just call those things back so that we can walk away in wholeness before our Father in worship and in truth. Father, in this day, as we are crying out to you with hearts that are prepared to say, Father, come inhabit every area of my life. Show us these things that is a stumbling block to your manifest presence in our lives. Help us, Father, to return and to become whole and to become complete so that we can walk a life filled with your Spirit and so that the people that walks next to us will be able to see you in our lives. Even through times that we are walking in difficult days, help us to proclaim your name in those things as well. Because you are with us and you are in us and your glory is has filled the earth. We praise you and we thank you, Father. So in this day, as we are praising your name together, as we have proclaimed your name, you know each one of us by name, Father. You have lifted up our heads. And we say, here we are, Father. Hineni. Draw us close so that in our preparation towards Shavuot, our hearts can be soft and pliable and that the seed of life will grow and bear much fruit. We thank you and we praise you. Amen.